Hey guys, Seventh here. Wanted to talk about something a little more personal today. So I guess you could say this is Seventh's emo moment. You always hear people talking about the perfect moment. And it's always the same things that they point to. And there's nothing wrong with this, but it's always the same shit. The day I was married. Uh, the day my first child was born. The day my child took his first steps. You know, it's the, it's the usual stuff. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is a bit cliche. Well, the thing of it is, I've been thinking about this a little bit since I started this new channel. And I was wondering if this was true of all gamers, or if it was just me and I'm even more of a nerd than I thought I was. And what that is, is the concept of the perfect gaming moment. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, oh, I went 55-0 and 0 in Call of Duty last night. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about high scores or getting the plaid or beating the final boss in the hardest difficulty. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about a moment in time in your life where when someone comes up to you and they say, why do you still play video games? Why do you like that so much? What is so special about video games? This moment or series of moments is the first thing that pops into your head. And maybe you're too embarrassed to tell them about it because it's kind of a personal thing to you, but it's there. That's the perfect gaming moment. And I'm gonna give you some examples of my perfect gaming moments to see if that'll better explain to you the concept that I'm talking about. My first perfect gaming moment, it was my last day of the third grade. I was about eight or nine, somewhere around in there. And uh, my mom kept me out of school that day. She called them and told them that I was sick with a summer cold. And she took me out all day long. She took me to the uh, local amusement park, which was called Lake Winnipesoka. It's still there. And we rode some rides and whatnot. And then she took me to uh, Toys R Us, or back then, not Toys R Us, it was Lionel Play World, and let me pick out a toy. I think I got some. G.I. Joe vehicle or something, I can't remember now. And uh, she took me to see Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which had just come out on the theater. So I saw Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at the theater, saw it at the Litchfield Cinema in Hickson, Tennessee. Then we left the Litchfield and we went across the street to the Northgate Mall. And in the parking lot was a place called Showbiz Pizza that I'd never been to before, I hadn't even heard of it. Now, for those of you who are not old enough to remember this, Showbiz Pizza is what they called Chuck E. Cheese back when it was still a cool place for anyone over the age of five to go. I bet that pizza tastes good. Mm -hmm. You've never seen a place like Showbiz Pizza Place. We'll serve you a pizza second to none. So come for the pizza, stay for the Showbiz Pizza Place with over 60 electronic games. Pizza baked fresh every day. And a stage show extravaganza on three stages. So come for the pizza, stay for the fun. This is back when they had the rock of fire explosion instead of a talking rat. This is when they had pizza that actually tasted good and a prize section that wasn't ate up with Barbie dolls and Hot Wheels. This was back when the gaming floor with skee-ball and a couple of prize games surrounded by all the newest arcade machines instead of the other way around. This is when Chuck E. Cheese was actually good, but it was called Showbiz back then. And she walked me in there and she ordered me a pizza and we sat and ate pizza and watched the Rock of Fire explosion on stage, which I'd never seen anything like that outside of Disney before, so I was really impressed by that. And then we went out on the game floor and she and I played skee-ball for a little bit and. You know, I had a pocket full of tickets in one pocket and, you know, a big handful of co uh, tokens in the other. And I saw the Mach 3 arcade cabinet for the first time. It was the sit-down one. Now, if y'all, for those of y'all that don't remember Mach 3, it was a game that used actual video footage with video game sprites superimposed over it. So it was kind of like playing Afterburner, only everything in the background was real and only your jet and what you were shooting at was computer generated. 
And I'd never seen anything like that before. That was a new concept back then, and I was just blown away by it. And I get out of that machine, and, I, and right across from it is the Dragon's Lair machine. It was brand new. And uh, I'd never seen anything like that before either, and I was just blown away by it. Even though now I look back on it, and it's really kind of a shitty game if you want to get down to it. But back then, there was nothing else like it, and it just the experience of being able to play it for the first time was really, really cool. And then, I walk around the corner and they've got a Pac-Man Jr. machine. Now this was the one, or is it Baby Pac-Man? I think it was Pac-Man Jr. though. Uh, this was the machine that was a combination of a Pac-Man arcade cabinet with a pinball machine. And I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I, I, I don't know how many tokens I popped into that thing just playing it. Knowing I wasn't going to earn any prizes from it, but it was more fun than anything else that I was doing. And I was just blown away. I just thought that was the coolest fucking thing ever. That is one of my perfect gaming moments because, you know, I can remember the sounds of the arcade and the taste of that pizza is still on my mouth and I can still hear the music coming from the stage area in the background, you know, kids running around everywhere, the sound of the ski ball balls rolling up the ramp. I can remember all of that like I'm still there. That's a perfect gaming moment. Second perfect gaming moment took place that same summer. My mom and my dad and my uncle and his family, we all drove down from Tennessee to go to Walt Disney World. We all stayed in the Contemporary Resort Hotel. For those of you who have been to Disney World, that's the great big building that's shaped like a letter A and the monorail goes right through the middle of it. Back then, it wasn't considered a deluxe resort because those three resorts around the lake were all they had. So they had to make them affordable so everyone could stay there. So you could stay at uh, the, that particular resort for maybe $70 a night. And it had the coolest arcade on the property. It was called the Fiesta Fun Center. And you walked in there and they had every kind of fast food you could imagine in this uh, kind of cafeteria type area and they had a Disney artist who was sitting in a booth with a big projector so you could see what he was drawing. And he would draw characters of you with Disney characters and whatnot. They had a movie theater in the back that only played old Disney movies like Dumbo and stuff like that. And you didn't have to pay to watch them. You could just walk in, get you some popcorn, sit down and watch the movie. And right next to the theater, they had an old-fashioned shooting gallery with the targets and the little, pist and the little rifles and whatnot. I remember walking around the corner there after playing a pinball machine. I can't remember which one it was. And there, for the first time, I ever saw the Buck Rogers and the Planet of Zoom arcade game. And at that time, I, even though it had been canceled for a couple of years, I was still a big fan of the old Buck Rogers TV show that came out in the eight, early 80s. And I rushed over to it, and I popped my quarter in, and I was just just enraptured with that game. And I play it now and it's kind of lame. But back then I just thought it was the shit. And I was just playing it back and forth. And I've been back to that arcade several times since then. And uh, I can remember that was the first time I ever saw a, 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 a Ghouls and Ghosts machine was in that arcade. And uh, they always had like the newest stuff. And so a lot of the games that I, that, you know, I was seeing them for the first time was when I'd go down there for the summer. But Never did I have an experience there like I did that first day, the first time I can remember being in that arcade and sitting there playing that Buck Rogers game. And you know, the, I, I can remember that there was, uh, even though the movie had been out for two years and no one cared about it back then, there was Tron stuff everywhere, and you and you could hear music from uh, the, from the jukebox. I was playing Journey and stuff like that. So it was almost like being in Flynn's arcade from the movie, and sitting there and playing Buck Rogers, and just time being stopped because there was no chores, no going to school, no homework. We were there all week. My cousins were there, which I was an only child, so they were the closest things I had to brothers and sisters, and we were all just having a hell of a time. And I remember leaving that game and going and playing uh, air hockey with my cousin, and then coming back over and playing Buck Rogers some more. And that was another perfect gaming moment. Stop me if I'm boring you now. The next perfect gaming moment was several years later that I can remember. I'm sure I've had more since then, but these are the ones that stick out in my memory. 
because it, it, when I think back to them, it's like I'm still there because I can remember every little minute detail of what was going on around me, and that's what part of what makes it the perfect gaming moment. I want to say it was spring break my 10th grade year, like 1990, and uh, it was the first morning of spring break, and I woke up or I woke up late. I slept in. I got up like 10.30 in the morning, something like that. And uh, I just laid there thinking, no, 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 I don't have to do shit today. And I don't have to do shit for two weeks. I can do whatever the hell I want. And so I just kind of laid there and stared at the ceiling for five, ten minutes, thinking about how great it was going to be to not have to do jack shit. And uh, my mom was already up at the crack of dawn doing her annual spring break, spring cleaning routine. And so the smell of, uh, like, uh, Windex and uh, pledge furniture polish and whatnot was kind of wafting in from the hallway. And I got up and I closed my door to kind of block out that smell. And I walked over and looked outside and, you know, it was a bright sunny day already. And I pushed my window open and opened up the screen and let the breeze blow in and, the, you know, the birds were chirping. And I had a big elm tree that was right outside my window and just the smell of spring, you know, fresh blooming flowers and, and uh, freshly cut grass and the smell of pollen in the air, it just came kind of blowing in. Just real cool breeze. I remember sitting down in front of my TV and I leaned back against my, uh, my bed and underneath my TV stand I had one of those plastic trays that they used to put out to keep your game consoles in. So your NES sat here, and then you had several plastic slots that your cartridges fit down in, maybe enough for 25 games, something like that, and then a little place for your two controllers. And I pulled that out, and I turned the TV on. I had the video going from the audio video out to my TV, and my audio was going out to my stereo, and I had one of those Yorks all-in-one piece rack stereo systems with the tower speakers that was uh, made for like, you know, 11 to 14 year age. You know, it was a less expensive stereo that was made to look like it was a rack, but it was all one piece. And it had like uh, twin tape decks and a, an old analog style radio with a, with a record player on top of it. Didn't even have a CD player at that point. And I cranked that up, and the first game that I reached for was Batman for the NES, the Sunsoft release based on the movie. And, uh, I hadn't beat it up until that point. I'd gotten close, but I kept getting my ass kicked by the Joker. And I sat and played that, and about an hour later I got to the Joker, and on my sixth, sixth or seventh attempt, I finally beat him. And I taped the whole thing, because, you know, what I'm doing now with this channel and showing myself earning platinum trophies and whatnot, this is nothing new for me. Because back then, everyone in the neighborhood had uh, an NES. And the way that we would prove that we had beat a game, rather than having to sit and play the whole thing in front of somebody, was we would record us beating the final boss. And so I had like tapes and tapes and tapes, like a whole shelf full of six hour VHS tapes that was just me beating NES, Super NES, Genesis games, all that kind of stuff. And it was just dozens and dozens and dozens of game endings. I wish I still had them. I threw them away when I moved out. But uh, I recorded it. And uh, I remember as soon as I was done, I started the whole game over, even though I just recorded the ending, and I played it again just to make sure that it wasn't a fluke and that I, I learned his pattern and could beat him again. And, you know, I can remember the smell in the air. I can remember the way the air felt coming in off the window, the sounds coming in from out of the window, uh, the sound of the vacuum cleaner from my mom cleaning the living room floor. I remember all of that like I'm still sitting there in that little room that I had when I was a teenager. And uh, this, was, this was before I uh, decided I needed to be an independent teenager and moved into the basement. Yes! Yes! At one time, even Seventh was a basement dweller. So that's another perfect moment. I got one more. One more! A couple of years later, I was 16 years old. And instead of doing our annual Disney trip, this time we went down to Panama City Beach, Florida. And this was years before Katrina, so there were still a lot of things to do in Panama City Beach. They had a water park, they had the Miracle Strip Amusement Park, 
you know, there was a lot of cool things to go do besides just hang out at the beach and get drunk or whatever. And the coolest arcade in town was in the uh, Miracle Strip Amusement Park. And our hotel was like right across the street from it. Uh, I want to say it was called like the Sand Dollar Hotel or something like that. It was one of those old ones that had been built in the 60s and was still sitting there. And uh, so every night, you know, I'd, I'd come in from the beach, take a quick shower, th uh, just to wash the, s the sand off of me, you know, throw on some clean clothes, and I'd run across the street to Miracle Strip. When everyone else was out riding the rides, which I'd already done the first day, I'd head right for the arcade. And this place had one of the coolest prize sections I've ever seen in my life. They had all sorts of shit in there. They had electric guitars, you know. They had uh, bamboo and uh, polished glass uh, coaster sets with a, with a coaster and a little rotating coaster tray. They had beach balls. They had beach towels, t-shirts, flip-flops with the Miracle Strip logo on them. You know, just all sorts of kick-ass shit that you never saw in any other prize, or at least not where, that I'd ever been to, any other prize area ever. And of course they had ski ball all the way down the wall. But the game that I played the most was called 21. And what you did was you sat in front of this machine and it had a, it had a piece of wood that was angled downwards with holes cut in it and a piece of glass over it to keep you from pushing your hand down in there. And each hole represented a card in a deck of cards. And what you did was you took these little balls and you'd roll them down the ramp and try to get as close to 21 by getting it to drop into the hole with the right card on it. And for whatever reason, I just became a master of this game. I could not lose at this game. And that night, I walked out with a bag of uh, tickets like this big. And the next night I went back, did the same thing again. Next night after that, same thing again. When I went back for my last night, I had a garbage bag big hefty garbage bag full of tickets that I'd earned from that game and it took me over an hour to turn in all my tickets and get all the stuff that I got which I got the little shitty electric guitar and you know I got the coaster set and I got a t-shirt and a hat and just an entire shopping bag full of shit you know and they, they say that stuff is bought on the ultra cheap so that no matter what they make their money back on it I don't think they made their money back on me because <laughs> because I got all the most expensive stuff that they had and I couldn't have spent more than 40 or 50 dollars on those games for over the five day period that I played it because I was just too damn good at the game. But that's not what made it a perfect gaming moment. The last night I was there before I cashed all my tickets in, I happened to turn around and I noticed a machine that I'd never seen before over the five days I've been there. For some reason, I hadn't seen it until I just happened to turn around and notice it sitting there. It was a Cloak and Dagger arcade cabinet. Now, again, for those of you who are not as old as me, are not gonna know what the hell Cloak and Dagger was. But there was a movie that came out starring Henry Thomas, the kid that played Elliot in E.T. And it was called Cloak and Dagger, and it was about this kid who lived in a broken home. I can't remember if his mom left or if she died or what have you, but it was just him and his Air Force commander dad. And his dad was hardly ever around because he was in the Air Force. And the kid had developed kind of an overactive imagination because of this. He was big into tabletop board games and tabletop role-playing games. And his favorite game was called Cloak and Dagger. And the hero of it was a character named Jack Flack. And Jack Flack was your typical Solid Snake, uh, super soldier mixed with James Bond type character. And basically, Jack Flack was his imaginary friend. He would appear to him and talk to him and tell him what to do and all this kind of stuff. And when he imagined him, it was always his dad, but in the Jack Flack outfit, you know? And so what happens is, uh, through a stunning set of coincidences, he happens across a video game cartridge where there's a hidden microchip inside of it that has plans for a bomb or some or a missile or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But then these Russian agents or whatever are chasing him to get the cartridge. And it was an Atari 52 cartridge called Cloak and Dagger. I can remember playing like uh, the 5200 cartridge and you know, it was really cool that I had the cartridge from the movie or at least I thought it was. But I'd never seen the arcade game. 
And so I turn around and here's this thing sitting there. And all I'd ever seen of it was pictures in magazines before. And it's not even that great of a game. It's, it's almost kind of like a, a Robotron 2084 style game with moving platforms. So you have to avoid, you know, uh, stuff coming at you and you have to grab items and whatnot. And, you know, be careful about where you're stepping because there's these revolving uh, platforms everywhere. I can remember standing there playing that game and I was a little bit sunburned and even though I'd taken a shower the smell of salt water was still on me and it was right across the street from the beach the smell of the ocean was thick in the air and it had that and there was there wasn't any air conditioning in the building it was a ceiling fans and so the the air was real humid and hot and thick those of you who live in Florida know what I'm talking about it had that thick humid Florida smell to the air. You know, in California, it's a little bit more of a drier heat. This is just real thick, like swamp type air, you know, but the smell of the sea on it. And, uh, you know, I could smell like the, uh, I remember the smell of the snowballs that they were selling, the snow cones that they were selling down the way, and the smell of uh, cotton candy everywhere, and the sound of the, the rides going because oh, at that particular park all the rides played really loud rock music and so there was just 80s era rock music of poison and shit uh, playing all over the place and just sitting there playing that game this game that I'd never seen before and you know and that was another perfect gaming moment and I said all that to say this I've always wondered if this was some like weird little quirk for me or if there are other people, other gamers out there that have had that kind of experience where when, like I said, when someone says, why are you, do you love gaming so much? You don't think of necessarily a particular game or a particular system, but you think of particular moments that you remember where gaming played an, an, an important part in that moment. You know, if I hadn't been a gamer, I wouldn't have been in the arcade and I wouldn't have seen that machine and I wouldn't have had all these girls walking around and all this. You know, it, just that kind of thing. If I, if I hadn't been a gamer, my mom wouldn't have taken me to showbiz for the first time. Moments that you remember that, for whatever reason, mean something to you on a personal level, but they're surrounded by gaming. Gaming is what caused them to happen. Perfect gaming moments. So what I want to know is if any of you out there have experienced that. You know, send me a PM. Post it in the comments. Make me response bits. Tell me about your perfect gaming moment. I'd like to know. You guys have a good night. This is Seven.